The Scottish people have a long and storied history of resistance, dating all the way back to the violent clashes with the Roman Empire. Millions around the world are the descendants of Scottish emigrants, many who, like my own ancestors, were forced from the lands that they had once farmed for generations. Yet despite this long and glorious history, some are not coherent or clear about exactly who is a Scottish person. From ancient lore and history, we will seek to answer who are the Scots. Hi friends, I'm Kevin McLean. Don't forget to like and subscribe and consider supporting the channel through Patreon or PayPal. Your support is very much appreciated. Much thanks to all of my supporters. Though in English the nation is called Scotland, the land of the Scots, in Gaelic it is known as Alba. This is by far the oldest name, for it comes from the ancient name for the entire island of Britain, Albion. After its use had long died away in Roman Britain, it continued on in Pictland as the name for their kingdom, and it's possible that in ancient days they considered themselves the rightful inheritors and lords of all the island. It's an Indo-European name, and may have been given to the island by the earliest Indo-European inhabitants in the Chalcolithic, the Beaker folk who crossed over largely from the area of the Netherlands and began to settle across Britain. Eventually, these settlers came to displace, eliminate, and absorb the remainder of the previous Neolithic populations in Scotland. A later migration, likely during the Bronze Age, brought a Celtic-speaking elite which came to rule over Britain and Ireland. Both these groups were closely related originally and may not have changed much culturally his later Celtic immigration from the continent may have had less impact on Scotland, but our earliest names and words for the Pictish language clearly demonstrate it to be Celtic, possibly independently evolving out of Proto-Celtic. The peoples of Bronze Age Scotland organized themselves politically around the kinship groups, with kings ruling tribes and tribal confederacies. They likely had a broader idea of ethnic identity that encapsulated their linguistic and cultural group beyond just these tribal structures. Druids were not restricted to tribes, nor were the Brethon lawgivers of Ireland, who could pass judgments based on the ancient law in any of the provinces or territories of the Gaels. This social arrangement could only be possible if there was a conception of the nation as encompassing all of the different tribes and political units of an entire people. Alongside the sacred pan-tribal institution of the Druids may have existed the notion of a high king, a king who rose above the various tribes to rule all the tribes of the extended nation, whose rule was of a sacred nature. Historical Irish accounts put great emphasis on this role of the High King. The Roman writer Tacitus records that the Britons long ago used to be ruled by a single king, but that this form of rule devolved into many tribal kings. Whether or not this was true in reality, it appears to have been a common idea among not only Celts, but Indo-Europeans generally. Though divided politically, the various tribes recognized themselves as part of a broader nation, united by language, culture, and blood. During the early Roman period, we learn of a number of gens, or nations, within the boundaries of modern Scotland. In the south were the Utadani, known in Old Welsh as Gwotodin. They were speakers of the Brythonic tongue which would have been understandable to someone in the area of Wales at the time. Trapran Law, Hillfort, was one of their early strongholds. To their north were the Maiatai, and north of them were the Caledoni. Their name appears to be cognate with the old Irish Caled, meaning hard. Both the Maiatai and the Caledoni were believed to have spoken a language 
later identified as Pictish. The language probably developed out of Proto-Celtic in slightly different ways to both the Gaels and those of Southern Britain, who were in closer linguistic contact with Gaul. By the 4th century AD, these people began being collectively referred to as the Picts, and gradually the separate tribal names dropped out of use. Many recent scholars have argued that there was no ethnic homogeneity to early Scotland and that the Picts were not a homogeneous ethnic group. This claim does not hold up to genetic evidence or common sense. While people organized locally and developed different local traditions, people living in a geographically isolated region, side by side, speaking the same language for thousands of years, who originated largely from the same source population group to begin with, are necessarily going to be very homogenous genetically and culturally. Detailed genetic studies can detect regional differences in the populations that may reflect a genetic Pictish ethnic group, but these genetic differences between different regions in Scotland are quite small, and indeed are quite small throughout all of Britain. The divisions were largely due to tribal structures and feuding, not significant ethnic differences or an inability to recognize common ethnic origins. This was the same with the Greeks, who, though they had many independent city-states, recognized and celebrated Greekness and were also able to set aside regional differences to unite against a common outside enemy. This type of process appears to have been the genesis of the ethnic identifier, Pict. The name Pict appears to be Latin in origin, meaning painted one. This comes from the traditional Celtic and indeed Indo-European habit of painting the body, not only in war, but also as a decoration. Sources from early Roman Britain say that women used to paint themselves so frequently with woad that it would stain their skin a dark blue. However, over time, Romanization changed the culture of the native population. They came to imitate Roman fashion. Those in the north, unconquered by the Romans, didn't give up these ancient customs. And by the third century, there was a marked cultural distinction between north and south. Rather than referring to the unromanized barbarians by individual tribal names, Romans began to refer to native Romanized Britons as Britons, and those who were unromanized as Picti, because they were Britons who continued to paint themselves in the barbarian fashion. Eventually, however, this Roman slur was taken on by the various tribal groups in the north and was used to forge a common political identity known as the Picts. An almost identical process occurred with the Gaels, as we will look at shortly. As the tribes of the north united in plundering Roman Britain, they called themselves Picts, likely as a specific anti-Roman identifier. They were declaring that they were unromanized and unsubjugated. This identity seems to have come to override the early tribal identities and new political organizations emerge as a counter to Roman power. The Picts were called in the Welsh language, Prydyn. This is simply the older indigenous Brythonic name for Britons. Early Gaelic writers called them the Cruthin, which is also cognate with Prydyn. The Romanized Britons, on the other hand, called themselves Brython, which, though very similar, is actually the Latin rendering of Prydyn. The native inhabitants in Roman Britain called themselves by a Latin name, yet knew the northerners by the true Brythonic name. It illustrates the divide that had manifested in Britain by the 4th century. The elites of Rome had changed the way that Britons in the south thought of themselves and viewed their northern cousins. The Scoti is first recorded by the Romans as a name given to seaborne raiders of Gaelic origin. Initially, the term was used for all Gaels. In Gaelic genealogical tales, Scoti is explained as having come from Scotia, 
the name of an Egyptian princess who was the mother of Goidil, the old Gaelic form of Gael. By disingenuous people, this story is taken as proof of the ethnically diverse nature of the Gaels, while in reality, it's a legend crafted around folk etymology used to give significance to an ethnic name which no longer was understood. As she is the mother of Goidil, who made the Goidelic language. He was bitten by a serpent and saved by a prayer from Moses, but was left with green skin, likely drawing on an earlier mythical account. The actual origin of the word Gael comes from Brythonic Goidel, meaning a savage, wild warrior. They would have picked up the title from the Britons, whom they frequently raided, and also established settlements throughout Wales in the waning days of the Roman Empire. They took it upon themselves as an ethnic title, and one not dissimilar in meaning from Scott. The process of acquiring this name is identical to the case of the Picts, but the name should not be confused with an identity. It isn't as though there were no Gales before the name. The nature of the identity was intrinsic, but only becomes crystallized in a name when encountering the other. There were very few others which the Gales or Picts were encountering before the Roman invasion. The true etymology of Scoti appears to be from Proto-Celtic scut, meaning to cut. This is nearly identical in meaning to the ethnic name Celt, from Proto-Celtic meaning to strike. The self-identification of early Celtic peoples was based on their martial nature, and Scot may in fact be an ancient local synonym for Celt. The warlike nature of the Scots is very well attested in ancient history. They were a constant thorn in the side of Roman Britain, raiding up and down the west coast on their swift ships. Gildas, writing in the 6th century, says that the downfall of Roman Britain was due to the united forces of the Scots and the Picts. Whether true or not, this was the impression that they left on people's minds. The most famous of such coordinated actions is known as the Barbarian Conspiracy, where Romans claimed Picts, Scots, and even Saxons had formed an alliance in which they attacked Roman Britain in unison. They may have not only raided during this period, but established control over existing settlements. They were eventually pushed back by concerted Roman military effort, but it wasn't long after that that the Romans left Britain, never to return. The Scoti were likely present in Scotland during and even before the Roman period. But by the 5th century, historical accounts attest to the kingdom known as Dalriada, the name meaning the portion of Riada, a personal name of its ancient founder. It was centered on present-day Argyll, meaning the coast of the Gaels. Genealogies say Dedad Makshen, meaning ancient, was the ancestor of the Dalriadans. He is also named the father of Daira, father of Kuroi and the ancestor of the Aeran, perhaps one of the oldest ruling groups of Ireland, whose tribal name is recorded by Roman period cartographer Ptolemy, and is related to the name for the island. He may also be the same figure as the god Lul, son of Cian, meaning ancient one, similar to Dedad Makshen. One genealogical list cites Lug Makshen, the genealogy suggests that the Dalria de Gaels originally believed they descended from the gods. One of the early kings was named Galam, which is said to be the true name of Milith, the mythical founder of the Milesians who settled Ireland. The Gaels and Picts had been cooperating in raiding activities on Roman Britain for several hundred years, and we can expect that this created a bond between these people. By the early medieval period, both groups shared a legend about how they were related to each other through blood. The earliest record of this myth is from St. Bede, writing about 730 AD. It was said that the Picts first landed in Ireland from Scythia, perhaps Scandinavia, although the later Gaelic account says it was from the Far East. 
They sought a place among the gales, but were not permitted to stay on the island. The gales sent them onward in friendly fashion to Scotland, where they settled. Yet they were in need of women for their community. The gales agreed to give some of their women, but in return, if a dispute arose over who should be king, the female line should decide. The account then presents the Picts as being half Gale. It may have been true of the nobility at this time. This is echoed in Gaelic tales, where it was Erevon, the first high king of the Gales, who granted the women to the Picts, who were distantly related to them through an ancient ancestor. It's similar to the account of the founding of Rome, and perhaps recalls the real ancient blood connections of the Bronze Age. They would have recognized that they were similar people who spoke distinct but related languages, just as the Romans knew that they were related to other Italic peoples. While we should not take the account literally, it is similar to other Indo-European founding tales, and shows that both the Picts and the Gaels believed that they were related by blood. These ancient connections, belief in common ancestry and genetic similarity, allowed the Picts and Scots to merge into a single ethnic group. Though the myths are not literal, their ethnic connections were not medieval fiction, but historical and genetic reality. They were both the descendants of Indo-European beaker folk, with similar customs, languages, and beliefs. While this was also true of other Britons, the myths suggest that the Picts viewed themselves and were viewed by others as more akin to the Gaels. Through the 5th and 6th century, the Scots expanded their power, establishing settlements in Galloway and throughout the highlands and islands. Yet in the 7th century, their power was checked by the Saxon Kingdom of Northumbria, becoming a client state for a time after losing several decisive battles. By the first half of the 8th century, the Picts under Ungus Macfurgusa had brought Dalriede under Pictish overlordship. Some say that Dalriede was absorbed into the Pictish kingdom at this time, but there soon came a devastating reversal. Due to attacks by Vikings, the Pictish nobility was suffering heavy defeats, with many nobles and kings falling in battle. It was this instability in the Pictish leadership that the newly crowned heir to Dalriede, Kenneth MacAlpin, or Kenneth MacAlpin, took advantage of. According to several medieval accounts, the king gathered his forces, marched on the Picts, defeated their leaders, and was crowned king of the Picts. The reality of this might have been more complex, for Kenneth may have been a potential heir to the Pictish throne through blood as well. That he inherits the title King of the Picts suggests that he was viewed as part of their kin group through blood. Likely, Kenneth MacAlpin was both a Scot and a Pict. He relocated to the heart of Pictland along with many other Gaels, and he and his descendants would work for the next 150 years building the foundations of the Kingdom of Scotland. Even before the coming to power of Kenneth MacAlpin, the Pictish elite had been marrying with the Gaels and were likely speaking Gaelic as a second language. After the destruction of the elite and the takeover of the Pictish kingdom by Gaelic speakers, this cultural and linguistic assimilation went into full swing. Culturally, they were not very different and they had lived side by side for hundreds of years, but linguistically the Picts also rapidly adopted Gaelic. It wasn't long after this that the Pictish identity was entirely absorbed into the Gaelic one. Kenneth ruled as King of the Picts, but his later descendants ruled as King of the Scots. In the Gaelic language, the name for the kingdom continued to be called Alba, after the Pictish custom, but in Latin, it became Scotia, and in English, Scotland, the land of the Scots. By the 11th century, all the Picts had become Gaelic-speaking Scots. The Pictish language and ethnic identity was absorbed into them, though some traces of Pictish language influence on Scottish Gaelic remain. 
It wasn't long after this that Saxon political influence began to grow. The primary method of this cultural influence was not war, but political marriages with English nobility. This undermined the ethnic identity of the King of the Scots. The power of this blood fusion was well understood, for it was the basis of the earlier tale of the Picts, and the results would eventually be similar. Mal Cullim MacDonaghede, Malcolm III, who reigned from 1058 to 1093, was the second last king of Alba to be fully ethnically Scottish. His wife, St. Margaret of Scotland, was ethnically English, didn't speak any Gaelic, and did not give her sons Gaelic names. Malcolm married her in order to gain a political alliance, yet when he died, the Scottish aristocracy, using the Gaelic system of tanistry, had Malcolm's brother, Donald Ban, crowned king. He had lived in Ireland for nearly two decades. Yet after he died, the sons of Malcolm, Edgar, Alexander, and David came to rule. These three, especially David, began the destruction of the traditional Gaelic ruling system and displaced the ethnically Scottish ruling class. When his brother Alexander died, David, who had been living in England for numerous years, fought to acquire the kingship of Scotland from Malcolm, Alexander's son, who was had out of wedlock with a native Scot. Many ethnic Scots fought on the side of Malcolm, while David obtained the aid of the English king, Henry, as well as Norman volunteers in order to defeat them in a grueling ten-year war. It shows widespread rejection among the Scots of this decidedly un-Scottish David. And it was English power that helped David to crush their resistance. David carried out sweeping reforms in Scotland that abolished the traditional Gaelic land system, replacing it with a feudal one, mimicking that of the Anglo-Normans. This dramatically changed the Scottish method of political rule. He changed the language of the Scottish court from Gaelic to Norman French. And even more than this, he invited elite immigrants from England and France to come and take up royal titles in Scotland and to rule over the Scottish people, forcing them into feudal servitude. Numerous nobles took up this lucrative offer, such as Walter Fitz Allen, the founder of the Stuarts. These changes and the seeming contempt that David had for the Scots, their traditions and institutions, would not in itself break down the identity of the people, but it began a long process of cultural and linguistic change. Numerous kings who followed David were sons of and husbands to Saxon or Norman women. It had a dramatic effect. They relegated Gaelic to the countryside, making the language and culture of the power centers French and Old English. However, the actual ethnic character of much of Scotland did not radically change. Instead, the self-perception and language of the people shifted, alongside with an increasingly anglicized elite. This started in the power centers and expanded outwards over the centuries. Yet there was also a counter-process to this as well, a Scotification. The de Bruce family is perhaps the most famous example. When Robert de Bruce was sent to battle the English for the liberation of Scotland, he sought aid from the Gales of Ireland, appealing to them as kin, saying, Whereas we and you, and our people and your people, free in ancient times, share the same national ancestry, and are urged to come together more eagerly and joyfully in friendship, by a common language and common custom. Some have presented this as Robert's cynicism. After all, de Bruce is a Belgian name, derived from the region now known as Bruges. The first known of his family was Robert de Bruce. He came to England in 1106 and fought alongside King David I in his war to gain the kingship of Scotland. For this service, he was awarded the title Lord of Annandale, However, Robert II 
Lord of Annandale, married the daughter of Uhtred Macfergus, Lord of Galloway, a Gael. King Robert I's mother was Marjorie, daughter of Neil Machlonchid, the second Earl of Carrick. In other words, Robert's mother was a Gael, and his male lineage was also partly Gaelic. He inherited the rule of Carrick, at the time a Gaelic region. He likely spoke Gaelic, and he married his first wife, Isabella of Mar, daughter of Don Mormar of Mar, a Gael. Though tragically, she died giving birth to Marjorie Bruce, mother of King Robert II. If she had lived to have a son, the cultural and linguistic landscape of Scotland might have been much different than what we know today. But Robert was remarried to the daughter of a Norman ruler in Ireland for political reasons, so it gave him little benefit in the end as his own father-in-law went to war against him on behalf of the English. When King Robert spoke of a common national ancestry with Ireland, he was not only speaking of his own lineage, however, but was speaking as the king of the ethnic Scots. The Declaration of Arboroth, written in 1320, defines the Scots as an ethnic group, saying, We know from the deeds of the ancients, and we read from books, because among the other great nations, of course, our nation of Scots has been described in many publications that crossing from Greater Scythia via the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Pillars of Heracles and living in Spain among the fiercest tribes for many years, it could be conquered by no one anywhere, no matter how barbarous the tribes. Afterwards, coming from there, 1,200 years from the Israelite people's crossing of the Red Sea to its home in the West, which it now holds having first thrown out the Britons and completely destroyed the Picts, and even though it was often attacked by the Norse, the Danes, and the English, it fought back with many victories and countless labors, and it has held itself ever since, free from all slavery, as the historians of old testify. In their own kingdom, 113 kings have reigned in their own blood royal, without interruption by foreigners. What is recounted is the same tale which is told by the Gales of Ireland, known as the Taking of Ireland by the Milesians. The Scots had been, by 1320, an identified ethnic group for over a thousand years, defined as a specific branch of Gales that resided in Scotland. That ethnic identity came to incorporate Picts and some people of Saxon, Norman, and Scandinavian ethnic backgrounds as they were absorbed into the general political and cultural framework of Scotland. And they could do this relatively easily, based on similar genetic characteristics and culture, thus blending in. Yet due to the increasingly Anglo-Norman nature of the ruling class of Scotland, and the growing power and influence of England, the language of the country began to change. By 1400, Scots began to refer to the form of English spoken in Scotland, and those who spoke Gaelic, formerly called Scoti, became known as Ersa, which was scorned by the now thoroughly English and Norman elite. Those who resided nearest the centers of power imitated the attitudes of their rulers for social gain, abandoning Gaelic for English, and building up a disdain for those who still spoke the original language of the Scots, even though in many cases those people were Scots themselves. The cultural and linguistic shift between late medieval and modern Scotland was almost exactly the reverse of the earlier process that occurred when the Gaelic Scoti acquired political power. The moment the ethnic Scots no longer held political power, their language, culture, and institutions were dismantled, aided by the Scots themselves, whose primary concern was to adapt to the new ruling class. It's a hard lesson in how a shift in the ethnic character of the elite can change the entire dynamic of a society. Culture, language, and ethnic identity is a complex system that the elite play an oversized role in shaping. 
The mass of society generally follows the trends of those elite, and if the ethnic character of that elite changes, the society will often follow them. More remote western regions in Scotland held on to their language longer because they had a separate regional base of power around the Lordship of the Isles and were further away from the anglicized centers of political and economic power. But over time, because of this conservatism, they became viewed as a separate ethnic group from the now English-speaking Scots, despite the term Scoti originally referring to a Gael. Despite the somewhat messy situation in terms of shifting language and identity, the origin of the Scots is clear. Originally, the term was used to denote a Gael, and later incorporated the Picts. Sometime in the Middle Ages, it expanded to include those of British, English, and Scandinavian ancestry who had resided in the territory of Scotland for generations. Then, in a corruption that illustrates how anti-Scottish the ruling class had become, the term begins to be used to differentiate an English-speaking Scot from a Gaelic-speaking Scot. By 1609, King James VI of Scotland, the son of an English nobleman, passed a law forcing the children of all clan chiefs to be educated in lowland Protestant English-speaking schools in an effort to break down the traditional Scottish language, culture, and Catholicism that was still very strong in the more rural northern and western areas. It was the first legal weapon in the cultural battle for the identity of the Scots, as the ruling class was now not only English-speaking but very often ethnically English or Norman. It was not one that could have been won without completely replacing the ruling class. Yet despite the linguistic and cultural changes that took place in Scotland as a result of the shifting ruling class, the Scots are still the same as those described by King Robert I and the Declaration of Arbroath, and those who have resided in Scotland since those ancient days, whether originally English, Pictish, British, or Gaels. I hope you guys liked this video, and if you did, please remember to press like, subscribe, and consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. Thank you all for listening, and as always, stand tall.